was from the time I was 18 to the time I was 22, I had never, like I, I didn't drink in, in between those times. Um, from the time I was 22 to the time I was 25, I about destroyed my life. The week would revolve around okay I need to get through my work week and what days am I gonna have open so that I can do these things because that's the only time I feel like I'm alive when I get out to the club all I was worried about was the money all I was worried about was drinking all I was worried about was partying being around the people that I enjoyed being around who the only thing I had in common with in the first place was the fact that we would just get drunk together and once you step back and look at it now um, I don't have anything, absolutely anything in common with any of the people that I used to think were my friends. Um, but what that lifestyle did was you start to seek that. What that is, uh, stepping into Christ now, what you start to see that is, is that's the world. You, you get lost in the world. The only time you feel like you're accepted is when you're out in the world. Um, and if the world loves you, uh, that's not good. We, we don't want the love of the world. Uh, well, I love the world back because I thought it had something to offer. Um, I ended up getting wrapped up in, in the drug game. I ended up getting wrapped up in, uh, it, it's one thing leads to another. It's, it's not, it's not, I'm going to go out and I'm going to drink. I, I, now I'm, I, now this is the person that I became, I'm radical. Uh, the Lord put me here to be radical. So if I'm radical, I'm going to be radical in the way that I'm going. And there's only two ways. You either serve God or you serve the devil. And when I was serving the wrong father, when I was serving the father of this world, I was serving him radically. And it's, it's not just a thing where you go out and you have a few beers with your buddies on a certain occasion. That's not the way I could do it. I wasn't coming home until 7 o'clock in the morning most of the time. Um, it was, and, and then all of a sudden... You, you don't realize, when, when you step into this stuff, you don't realize the spiritual warfare that's involved. So, you don't realize what you're walking with and why there's such a pull in that direction. You start to seek these things out. It got to a point where I was just drinking. I said, I'm just going to drink. Uh, you know, I'm just going to party. I, I'm, a normal, I'm a normal American just enjoying himself, like just enjoying a time out with people and his friends. Um, no, that's not what happened. I ended up jumping into the drug game, chasing money. There was two times I got caught up and was, was almost killed um, twice by other people and twice by my own hand. My life became so miserable um, because you start to get the things that you think are going to make it whole and then you realize why am I here because you get them and there is absolutely no joy and no satisfaction. There is no complete there is no feeling there's there's absolutely nothing so um, you end up walking in just complete emptiness as I'm walking around with this dead lifeless feeling going through um, going through the days just uh, you, you know you I'm running the gym I, I'm going to work and and just everything is, is dead to me everything is just completely routine I got this spider bite <clears throat> on my knee and it was from a brown recluse <clears throat> and uh yeah it was it was bad like the skin's falling off there's a big hole in my knee it's swollen i can't hardly walk on my left leg is it, it, the swelling goes all the way up into my hip i can't hardly move it well then you came to the gym and you said you were going to pray um pray with me and uh and you laid hands on me. I thought, you know, this whole thing is a joke, you know, but whatever, I'll do what it takes to please, to please you. Um, and you prayed with me, uh, with, put your hand on my knee and I felt it heat up. The next day I had a doctor's appointment and woke up and I didn't, I went, but I didn't need to go. My knee had completely went down. The skin started to grow back around it. It was amazing. Well, something clicked that from that moment on, I started to feel again something broke now even when I was out getting trashed 
even when I was in, in the lowliest of places, um, and, and running around with, with drugs flying one way and, and alcohol flying the other one way and guns being, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm telling people about how my brother can access Christ to the point where healing takes place. And everybody knew that I was skeptical of any type of supernatural ghost, any, uh, it wasn't happening, I didn't even believe in Jesus, but I did believe in my brother, I did believe in you. So I was preaching the gospel of you to them, and that became the gospel of Jesus. And they knew better than to say anything because while I wasn't walking with Jesus at that time, if they were to tell me I was a liar, then I would, it, there would be an uproar. So they had to sit and listen to the gospel, otherwise they would make me angry. But what I don't think I realize and what people don't realize is that Christ doesn't come easy because he doesn't want a little bit of you because he didn't die 50, 75 percent on the cross. He died 100 percent on the cross and so he calls us to do the same for him. We have to die 100 percent. So I'm preaching this, something turns over my heart where I start to believe. And once I started to believe, then things got really bad. And so one night, I, I, I had the dreams, whatever, they were terrifying, but then one night physically, my arm gets pulled. I said, man, I think something was playing with my fingers. Something was pulling my arm. Um, and then the next night is when it just took off. You know, full body presence, it was just dark, man, you know. Um, and these things, they try, to, they try to settle this atmosphere of, of ease so you can sit in their presence and you can watch them. Um, what I didn't understand is that what I was seeing was being projected through me to me. So I'm thinking it's in my house, but really it's in the temple. Uh, you know, sin was dwelling within me. So seven months, about seven months, I would say, of this going on. Uh, and then I went to you and I told you and Mike, and I said, man, you know, this is what's going on. I think I'm going schizophrenic. Um, I'm seeing these shadows. My body will go numb and my arms will start doing things that I, my legs, I was levitating. But really, you're not levitating because you're being held up, you know. Um, just really, really bad stuff going on. And uh, I was so relieved. I was so relieved because when I brought the news to you, you said, no, you got a demon. And I said, oh, thank God, you know, because... I didn't want to be schizophrenic. Every time that I would get prayer for these things, I would go back home and I would say, man, okay, I got it out, and I'm, now I'm just going to keep living the way I want to live. And I remember every time during deliverance, people would say, the Lord's, the Lord's going to place in your head right now what He wants from you, and He did. He placed three things. And every time I'd say, you're not getting those. You can have everything else. But that's that's so far off from what God expects he wants it all and more if you got a pizza and you say Lord you can have 75% of that pizza and you leave a little slice that's that's not acceptable he wants the whole thing what that piece what that piece of pizza turns into is a triangle bell and you might as well start ringing it because that's the enemy's playground and they're gonna come feast on it I'm going to let you know what I went through in order to get this treasure called Christ. Months, seven months, I would have things coming into my bedroom and crawling on top of me and licking my face and whispering to me. When it got bad was the fourth deliverance when, I, when it spoke to me and it said, if you allow them to cast me out, I'm wrapped so tightly around your spine that I'll break your back and I'll twist your jaw when I come out. And the whole thing is, is just... I didn't know who I was in Christ and how strong I was in Christ or this thing would have never had the grip on me that it did in the first place. But after the first two times that there was, you practiced deliverance on, you, you did deliverance on me, um, it ended up getting worse and worse and worse, which is now what the Father's showing me is how true scripture is. Yeah, you went through deliverance, but you didn't, you didn't fill the house and you didn't give me the doors that remained open, which were the three things that I wanted. So they're coming back worse every time because you won't submit. And the scripture stands true and all that said to me was, man, this, this, this Jesus guy, he's a pretty honest dude. Like, like he, this stuff is true. 
and it applies to me now. Now this is working out in my life, and I don't need a, a, a deliverance a deliverance book. All you need is the Bible because he, he didn't leave us here at all, but he certainly didn't leave us here without a life manuscript, without without a, a lifeline to look at and say this is what we do. And the Bible is to be taken literally. It's not something that was spoken years ago to a generation that that has fallen now and maybe at some time it applies every single day in every single situation. And so what I did is I said, well, I'm going to press into this. In the name of Jesus, I command you to leave. It worked. They started to go away. But I didn't give the Lord what he wanted. Pretty soon. Now it talks about, it talks about in the Bible where if a brother... If a brother is, 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 decides an alternative lifestyle, he is to be turned over to sin. Okay, well, well, that didn't happen to me by brothers. It happened to me by God. Where the Lord said, you want to walk with this and you know what this is, I will turn you over. At that point, when these things would come into my room and I would call on his name, absolutely nothing would happen. And I would say, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's like, well, why are you even talking to me when you're freely walking the other way? Now, Christ never took his eyes off of me in this process, but he made sure, he made sure that I knew the difference between life or death, even if it drove me to it. He put me in a corner so deep by removing his hand from me and showing me how with me he was the whole my whole life even when I wasn't in him with I wasn't engaging him I wasn't living for him he was with me mercy and grace and love until this point here when I started to abuse him when I started to use him for what I needed instead of using me for what he needed and I started saying well these demons run from his name he must be the real God because this is the only name it's not Buddha it's not Allah it was the name of Jesus that made these things leave and I said wow that's cool so all I got to do is say Jesus well Jesus wasn't with me anymore so I was getting eaten alive and when you talk about Savior oh Savior it's not words that you're singing it's not something in a book where you say my Savior Jesus Christ no Savior is the right word but it's a literal term he literally saved me because I was put in a corner by these things to the point where I tried to commit suicide. And I said, you know what? And I look up and, and really he backs you into this corner. And you don't, you don't realize that you're not fighting demons. It's never about demons and it's never about Satan's power over you. It's about you battling Christ. It's about you battling your calling in Jesus. And he's calling you to die and you don't want to. But I remember as the lights get shut off and we're going to bed and I'm looking over at this doorway, I begin to see this movement. I said, oh great, another shadow that's going to come get me. You know, um, this, is, this is awesome. And lo and behold, here comes a little figure, you know, um, with a spear. And it, it, it sounds funky, I know. Uh, but this was the world that I lived in, you know. And all at once something locks up my legs and begins to twist and the hand was so big that it went over both my legs and the wh where I was sleeping there is space behind and my legs are being twisted this way and my upper body is being twisted this way and my head gets twisted to the point where I'm looking up into the eyes of this creature that's standing above me and it's looking down on me face to face almost nose to nose now in this in like the seven months that I had been seeing this every night I hadn't seen this guy and I hadn't seen that guy but I had seen the shadows that come up and they were twisting me up I mean they were physically doing harm to the point where my legs were bruising up stuff like that anyways very physical it wasn't dreams it was real with this it was like a night terror I was feeling this overwhelming fear I was it, anxiety like everything that you could possibly imagine loneliness uh, no hope you know as I'm looking into this creature's eyes 
And then this little guy moves forward and he runs this spear into my ribs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this hurts really bad. So I'm trying to tap, tap um, Amy, who is my girlfriend. I'm trying to tap her. And I'm trying to scream at the same time, but I can't scream because I'm so twisted that my, my lungs won't breathe to get the air out. And I hear her calling my name and that's when I realized I was never asleep. This stuff happened. I walked to the back door and she goes, what's wrong? What's wrong? Should I call Chris? I said, no. I said, uh, and, and when I went to speak again, I just couldn't open my mouth. And I was almost in tears and I opened the back door and I remember looking at the, the fence and I was just like, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to run. I'm going to hop the fence and I'm just going to go because I can't, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what to do. And I realized, you know, I can't run from it because it's not the house. It was me. You know, I stayed at other people's houses and the same stuff would happen because it was my temple that was dirty, not my house. How am I ever, ever, ever going to do this? And why have you left me? Why have you left me? And, and I said, this is ridiculous. I think I even made the comment, you know, I don't have to do anything to be embraced by these things, but you act like I have to try so hard. And he's really saying, all you got to do is die already. It's just time to die. And all of a sudden, I, at 4.57, I go out. After one of the most horrific experiences I had ever had that turned out to be a living hell that was a reality, I went out. From 4.57 to 5.10, I'm standing in a desert, and I'm surrounded by what I use as a term of thousands upon thousands of Chris Ishaks. But, uh, but no, it was, people were speaking in Arabic, um, I believe, I don't know, it was really fast language, it wasn't Spanish. Um, but uh, they're all wearing, we're all wearing white gowns, we're wearing sandals, um, and there's just a palm tree off to the right, but it's a desert and just a mass crowd of people, a huge crowd of people, but there was no buildings or structures, there was a palm tree here and a palm tree over there. And then there was a little line of palm trees off to the right. And we're all standing. And all at once a horn blows. Boom. And everybody hits their knees. And I'm, I remember I was face down in the sand. And the sand was hot on my hands. And I'm trying to look over at the guy that's bowed down next to me. And I'm digging my hands beneath the sand to keep him cool. And I tried to look over at him and say, what is this? But I couldn't stand up I couldn't move it was like something hit my knees and I went down everybody fell down and they're all saying something and I don't know what they're saying and I hear these footsteps boom 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 and as I start to look up I see this elephant and these massive elephant just boom 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 coming through the middle of these people and I got like front row tickets to it because it just so happens to be passing by me and as I look up further I see these legs and then I get called out and I hear you and immediately it's like something lifts me and I get lifted to my feet and lo and behold there's Jesus on top of this elephant and I can't tell you what his face looked like but I can tell you that his legs were, were, were like they were bronze almost like statue, you know? Um, his hair was a bronze gold, not, not blonde, but like a sun bronze, like a, like a, um, and it looked like it was a statue too because there wasn't one hair out of place and it came down to about here on the middle of his back and curls and came down to about here. And his face, he looked at me, and right now if you could go inside my mind, you could see his face. But I can't tell you what it looked like. I can't and it's really weird because it's there and it's gone it's there and it's gone and right now I see it again boom and it's gone I can't tell you what his face looked like but he's wearing this white and the white is not blinding light it's not ooh the sun you know burns my eyes it's just so white that it's unreal that, that if you saw something like this you would know that it wasn't from this earth and that's how white his robe was. And he looks at me and he says, you, I know you. And then he looks back over this crowd of millions of people and says, I know this man. 
and his voice carries. Then he turns back over to me and he says, but I don't know your name. And at that, the horn blows and my knees hit the ground and I go face down again. And I wake back up and it's 5'10". So after my heart's racing, I can't fall asleep and he takes me out, boom. After I was just sitting there swearing to him about how he had left me alone. What that was, was a call to a deeper intimacy with Christ. And when he said, I know you, I know you, because I believe in him now, and I confess that he is my king and my savior, but I wasn't dying to him. He knew me. That might have been enough to get into heaven, but he didn't know my name. He wants to know my name. He doesn't just want me to come through the gates so he can shake my hand. He wants to walk with me here on earth. He wants to have that type of intimate relationship. I gave my heart over to Jesus after that. And the day that I gave my heart to Jesus, I thought all these nights put together where I'd been twisted up, where I'd been beat up and bruised up, pulled out of bed, levitated, thrown on my face. I'd been shoved into walls. And I said, oh my gosh, this is powerful. These demons are, you know, they're absolutely nothing. Because when I sat there the next day and I said, Lord, here's those three things that were right here on every deliverance and you can have those. I'm going to try this Jesus thing. But this is going to be hard, Lord. And the minute, I didn't even say it out loud. The minute I said, you can have what's left of me. Not Nick Lachey song, dude. Don't stop singing it. But... When I said, you can have what's left of me, take it, take it. My chest rose right here. My chest rose up and this was not, this was physical. This was a physical feeling where my phone's to my left and I reach for it and I'm being held back and my chest lifted up and it was such a peaceful pain that it was, it was, it was, everything was all right but I thought I was gonna die. And my chest lifts up, my heart's thumping, and I'm like, man, I'm dying. You know, these demons, because when you walk in darkness so long, you don't know what Christ feels like. You only know the demonic. When you walk in darkness, everything is darkness to you, even light. So as Christ is removing these things and I'm feeling the Holy Spirit fall on me and the Holy Spirit move in me and make its home with me, and it's so peaceful, all I can think about is demons because that's all I'd walked with my whole life. So as that's lifting up and I say, oh my Lord, geez, I need to call 911 because these things know now that I gave my life to Jesus and they're going to kill me. No, my death never came. But I'm going to tell you what, in an instant, with the lifestyle I was living to, I was addicted to the lifestyle I was living to, hanging out late running around drinking, hanging out with the boys, coming home at seven o'clock in the morning. That was my escape. That was my getaway. And when the Lord took what I thought was my life, he took the desires that went with it. I read the Bible for six hours after that because I wanted to, because I was being fed. And day after day after day, I was in the Word for six hours because I loved Jesus. Because when you receive His Spirit, Christ can't deny Himself. And if His Spirit lives in you, how can you deny Him? Because what comes and lives in you is a love for Jesus. The love for Jesus broke everything else, all the darkness that I had experienced. And from the moment I gave my life to Jesus, I stepped into a ministry where I started to move in the power of Jesus. And the only hunger that I wanted was and I was completely satisfied, but always hungry for more Jesus. You can't stop. You can't stop moving in the power of Jesus because when you realize that Jesus is here, Jesus is real and you feel his presence. And, 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 and I'm gonna clarify this. Not everybody has to move the way I do or get spoke to the way I do about Jesus. And Jesus doesn't speak to everybody the way he speaks to me. But for people to say, well, I'm just not called to a life of ministry. I'm just not called into full-time ministry. 
No, you don't need to have a church or a full-time ministry, but you are called to a full-time ministry of Jesus because Jesus isn't a secret. So if you work at a Walgreens, if you work at a McDonald's, you should be talking about Jesus. I worked in a place that didn't allow it and I said, you, you can fire me because I can't stop talking about Jesus. I don't know that I'm called into a full-time ministry. I just love Jesus. I just know what a Christian is. And a Christian is to step into Jesus, to give, to give everything that you want to give, give everything, everything that you can possibly give, even the ones, I'm telling you what, the, the times that I've had God speak to me now, from that time on, the only time I've heard the audible voice of God was always things that I didn't want to hear. But I was so happy to give him what he wanted. He kicked me out of my house. He told me he didn't know me the way he wanted to know me. And both times I said, man, you can take this. He told me to get a tattoo changed. And people think that you have to be in some drastic situation to hear the Lord. If you're a Christian, your son's a God, and he loves to talk to you. People to say, oh, I don't do this, I don't know. Bullcrap. Step into Christ with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your body. Give him everything, and you're going to receive so much more. The, the, the parable that's coming to mind right now is, is the treasure in the field. Where the, where, the man, where the man buys the treasure in the field, or finds the, finds the treasure in the field, he goes and in all his joy, he sells everything he has to go and purchase that field. Well, it's time to sell everything that you have, because the treasure is Christ.